He is not El Chipo, he is El Shaddai. You may hate my harvest, but you don't know my seed. This is my guest today, Bishop Kevin Wallace. Welcome. To me, that's the simplest definition of the anointing, God's presence on a human life, empowering that life to do what it could not do in its own strength. You wanna know when Jesus got a fresh anointing? Jesus got a fresh anointing after Judas had went and sold him. Uh, it, you don't want to do it. Jesus got a fresh anointing. He goes in a 40 day wilderness. The Bible said he walked in the wilderness in the spirit. He came out of the wilderness in the power. If there's an oil on their life, they've been through some stuff. I am finding most people who say they are deconstructing, they are not deconstructing. It's just pure demolition. There are real tragedies with church hurt. Yeah. I get that. But if we're not careful, and we don't know how to kindly, gently, lovingly speak the truth about this. What we do is we allow a spirit of offense to grow in the heart of a person like Esau, who had a had a root of bitterness yep. that wound Hebrews up 12. destroying his entire life. Yeah. Cessationism is trying to gain ground right now. I know you are not a cessationist. The modern day use of the the gifts of the spirit. Here's what I will. Here's what I will say to you. Here. I did not know that. Nobody knows that. Oh. I've never shared that before. Wow. Hey, welcome to the No Counterfeit Podcast. Today, I am thrilled beyond explanation to be sitting across the table having a conversation with a man who I have looked up to from afar for quite some time. There are many men in ministry who are doing great things, but there are certain people who carry something significant. <laughs> that are not compromising in what they carry in order to leverage um, some new creative thing or some new idea. Somebody who sticks to the book, preaches the tried and true gospel, the blood of Jesus. I don't really know if anybody's doing it as good as my guest today, Bishop Kevin Wallace, welcome to the podcast. Man, I'm honored to be with you, Keenan, and to watch what you've done and how God's blessed you and what you've done with that influence and the way you're impacting the generation is really refreshing. And I'm humbled. I'm honored to be with you today. So thanks for inviting me and looking forward to this time together. I feel like I'm like in the big leagues now, oh, sitting please. here with the bishop. Stop, the bishop, stop, come stop. on. You're crazy. Um, no, it's such an honor to get to sit with you. I'd like to just jump right in. As I kind of alluded to in my introduction of you, there are certain things I have watched up till recently just from afar mm. of your ministry, um, the way you and Pastor Devin both honor one another mm. beautifully, lead together beautifully. Uh, but the way you really, I was even telling Beth last night, obviously right now we are recording this in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right. Um, but I was telling Beth when we were leaving the conference last night, I was like, Bishop is literally like, you just look at him and he's, he's a father. Mm. Like, not to sound weird, but you're the kind of guy you want to crawl up in his lap uh -huh. and just have him like tell you it's going to be okay. Yeah. Like, uh, luckily you have the frame to do so. <laughs> and so you're a man of stature, but you, there, everything about you exudes mm. The heart of a father. Yeah. I mean, last night is like people are worshiping. I saw, I think it was his name's Jaden, yeah. camera guy. Come, I didn't know it at the, the time, but a camera guy just come by and you just grabbed him, kissed him on the head. I mean, mm. it was just very fatherly. Yeah. Um, and I think, as from what I can tell, that's you on and off the platform. It is. Not only that, but you are a preacher. Mm. And I mean, preacher. Number one, God's just blessed you with an incredible preaching voice. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, you are going for it. I, yeah. I, and there's just, there's an anointing on it. And you're not afraid to talk about things that are, are pertinent. You're not afraid to talk about things where the Bible says, this is what we should be contending for. Mm -hmm. What are some things, if you could speak to the next generation of preachers out there, what are some things you would plead with them mm -hmm. to contend for or to stay away from, to make a big deal or to, to just make it less of a thing? What are some things you're seeing, if you could speak mm -hmm. to pre young preachers out there? Well, I, you know, I think one thing that has resonated in my heart, and more so in the last several years, I think authenticity mm. is, is a real missing component uh, in our, in our uh, preaching, in, in American church especially. I can't say so much around the world, but... It feels like the, the pulpit in America, there's a certain pressure and there's all kinds of pressure and there's all kinds of opinions and there's yeah. all kind of, you know, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing this. And sometimes preachers wake up and don't have a clue what we need to be doing because we're trying to really be effective and we're being told, mm -hmm. 
this is how you be effective or that is how you, what you do to be effective. Yeah. And we, and we get divorced from the authentic us and we become a shell of who God created us to be Mm -hmm. operating in what I would call Saul's armor Mm -hmm. when it's not been tried. It's not really who we are. It worked for Saul, but David is not Saul. David has Mm -hmm. the ability to run and swing a rock and kill the giant and other beasts and other enemies. And he was authentically himself. And I fear for the American pulpit that we're losing our authenticity as we attempt to conform. And it's not even conform to the world. It's yeah. conform to this idea. And I, I hope you hear my heart on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, everything now is about communication. Everything now is about you're a great communicator. I have nothing wrong with being a great communicator. I think we need communicators, brilliant minds. There's a place at the table for every kind of communicator. But for the preachers, I want you to hear me. It's not about how loud you preach or how much you sweat. And I get loud and I sweat. And you know the whole, (laughs) that's just me authentically, however. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Be authentic Mm. and don't. Uh, don't live under a personal microscope of introspection where, you know, you're, I, 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 there have there was a season in my life I felt like my delivery style was uh, prehistoric. I, I felt like a dinosaur. And sometimes you hear these amazing guys that are being used by God all over the earth, and, and they're just brilliant in their communication, their ability to communicate a narrative, a story. Right. I listen to that, and I think, why can't I do that sometimes? But that's just not my grace, my mm. oil, my... I came through tremendous pressure. I went through tremendous fires. I came through Hell's Kitchen and escaped without the hair of my head being singed. And when you come out of that kind of birthing and you're birthed through that kind of pressure and pain and things that that God allowed me in his grace to go through but sustained me by his power, you don't come out whispering and trite and, you know, telling Mm. you, you come out preaching. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And it's what I've, it's just authentically me. So I would plead for authenticity, be you, be the real you, and don't be ashamed or afraid to pin your ears back and to let it go. Don't be ashamed or afraid to communicate. If you're, if you're a talker, you don't have, I I tell sons that all the time. Don't try to preach like me. It'll, Mm -hmm. it'll make, and I won't try to talk like you because that makes me look like a fool. And let's just be us. Yes. Be authentically us. And, um, I would, I would say first and foremost, be authentic. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard th- this said. Um, you've got to be willing to be an echo mm. before you can be a voice, yes. which I get the sentiment of, and I, sure. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Um, this idea of, you know, and I, I would even say this, that God has called us to be faithful stewards of the gospel, not original content creators, right? right? Oh, yeah. So even if you are saying something and you are literally repeating it, yeah. verbatim the way you heard it, yeah. as long as it is faithful to the book, I think that is what we should focus on more than what's an original revelation from this passage. No one has ever found, no, what's a nugget no one's ever seen? What light could I hold this up in? But what is? where's the balance? Where's the grace? Where's the tipping point yeah. between being willing to be that echo in the beginning mm-hmm. and learning how to find your voice? Like yeah. we're, all, we, we're kidding ourselves if we think that in some shape, form, or fashion, the environment, the church environment, the preacher environment we grew up in isn't shaping our communication style, isn't 100%. shaping the way we are communicating the gospel. 100%. So for you, where is that balance of emulating mm-hmm. people that you yes. esteem and learn sure. from and being willing to be Bishop Kevin Wallace at That's, the same time? That is a great question. And you know, the reality of it is that Bishop Kevin Wallace is a product of the preachers that I was raised listening to. And I can... I can I could take you down the river and navigate you through the the moving current of the people that I was exposed to as a young boy. Yeah. And as I grew into a teenager and laid on my laid on my 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 belly with my face in my hands on Tuesday night and listened to Bishop Jakes and to Rod yeah. Parsley and then the preachers I was raised with on a more regional personal level, you know, James Barker, who no one no one in the earth will ever in some massive way know him, but I heard him preach every Sunday. These voices and these influences shape you. Yeah. And there is a there is a season of your life of emulation. And and, and there I say even imitation. Mm-hmm. Because you 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 rep you reproduce what you have experienced. But there is a there is a time when 
uh, like Eleazar, the sword clings to your hand. Mm -hmm. You know, your hand clings to the sword. It's like one hand, and it really becomes um, just your oil. It becomes yeah. your it becomes your armor. And over time, I've especially early, I've recognized that is not though. I saw that and I tried that. That's not original, or not even original. That's just not me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't. That doesn't. But I have eased into my skin over the twenty five years of ministry, and, yeah. and I've said that that that's who God's called me to be. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say, you make a brilliant point regarding originality. Um, I I think that has become a trap for some people. Originality. I want to be original. I don't want to be a copy of anything. Okay, I appreciate you not wanting to uh, plagiarize. I appreciate, appreciate you not wanting to... But most of the time when we say we want to be original, we want some proprietary evidence that we are one of a kind. I think that's a trap because I've watched guys who stretch the Bible to produce revelation that I don't think is revelation. I think it's actually a misrepresentation of information. That's good, yeah. And, and, and when you have a true spirit of wisdom and revelation on you, hear me, the text is brilliant because it was written by the Holy Spirit. It is in the text. The, yeah. the revelation is in the text, and it's... Um, William McDowell said to me, Bishop, sometime, one time he said to me, Bishop, it's like that revelation you gave was like a third, you had a third eye. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Right. Mm -hmm. It's there. Two eyes sometimes with our natural eyes, we can't see it, but the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to get into, you know, the third eye thing, but I'm just saying. I got you. That spirit ability to see what is there that sometimes the flesh doesn't let you see. Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I think ultimately those things can only come about by genuinely studying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And I think honestly, at least in my opinion, and again, this I have not been doing I have been doing this for but a fraction mm -hmm. of the time in which you have. Uh, I'm still wet behind the ear as a preacher. Well. But in in the in the seasons in which like I've gotten some stuff that I felt like was, man, this is weighty. Yeah. It ultimately was when I wasn't looking for a sermon. Yeah. Because I think that's when you you're you're calm enough. Yeah. You're kind that's of um, you're in a you're in a posture of receiving. Not you're you're not like God give me give me give me. I got to have something for them. But you're like I'm just doing the the daily discipline yeah. of getting in the word of God. And you are somebody who I I think it's it's it comes out no matter what sermon or what topic you're preaching on. You have a high view of the word of God. Oh yes. Extremely high view. The high theological. Yeah. Um, importance on us dissecting, mm -hmm. exegeting passages mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like people interpreting scripture, could you dive deeper into that? What are some tips, tricks you would give the up and coming preachers on a proper exegesis, mm -hmm. proper interpretation, proper hermeneutics? Mm -hmm. I know those are really big words, but oh. for the people who this information is pertinent to, they get it. Yeah. What are some things that you utilize, yeah. you look for? To help you stay inside the boundaries. You know, I again, I enjoy uh, I I enjoy reading for mm. my personal food. Okay. So I'm feeding a lot of people at this stage in my life, as you are. You're feeding actually more people uh, through the social media realm than uh, than than I certainly um, am at this uh, stage, even in my life. And I I have heard your exegete. I've heard your you you walk in the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and it's really Thank brilliant you. and it's marvelous to see again we have this dearth of uh i think it's a dearth of confidence in the word number one mm -hmm. i think we have even in the pulpit uh we're not quite sure the word has a relevant application i think the brilliance of preaching right now is can you take the word of god and can you help me with your teaching and preaching gift and anointing can it intersect somewhere in an applicable way? Yeah. In a, I don't like the word practical all the time, but there is some practicality to the word of God. Our exegesis should not be about being so deep. And I get nervous with these guys uh. who, who want to go so, so deep. It's not deep, it's hidden. Here's the thing. That's Revelation good. is not mysterious almost. Revelation is hidden not from, but for. I think there are things in my journey, and I'm grateful to God. I got this understanding some time ago. I thought to myself, I preached this text so many times, or this scripture, I've referenced it so many times, and yet in this season, 
God began to show me something in the text that although I had studied it before and seen it before and delved, delved into it before, yeah. it began to illuminate in a way I'd never seen it before. And I thought to myself, boy, I wish I would have gotten that when I was 25. That would have been great to put on that message. And I heard the Lord whisper to me, you didn't need it then. Wow. But you need that revelation now. And revelation is, again, I always tell sons this, revelation is not hidden from, it's hidden for. Yes. And uh, I, I I often, I know that scripture, but it's in Proverbs, it said, it's the um, uh, the, the joy of a king to search out a matter. I, yeah. I, I, the, the, the language might be a little bit off, but the thought is there. True kings know how to go gold digging in the text. It is there. You don't have to step out of it. It's there. And the last thing I will say on it is, by way of the Spirit, sometimes I have to meditate and chew on it a while. Mm -hmm. And I, I just keep chewing and I say there's something else there. And then the Spirit of God just rip a lid off and you see, oh my Lord, that was there the whole time. And it brings a tremendous, it, it's, an in, uh, it's a revelation. And I'm really clear about this too because mm -hmm. I don't want to make a mountain out of a mojo. We have a real infatuation with insight. That's yes. Okay. Insight will leave you enamored with a man. Wow. Revelation will leave you enamored with Jesus. That's so good. There's a difference. And I think that we have to be very careful in wanting to have nuggets. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have notebooks full of nuggets. People have written down that they'll never live mm -hmm. because it was an insight. But revelation came from the Holy Spirit and boom, it wakes something up on the inside. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned this idea of your anointing. You said mm -hmm. you, you take, you listed a few things. And one of the things you listed was taking your anointing. Mm -hmm. I would love if you would unpack not only what is the anointing, but the pertinence of the anointing mm -hmm. in, t t in today's world. It mm -hmm. seems to me as though, again, I'm not trying to attack. I'm not trying to villainize. I'm not trying to no. demonize, but it seems as though the church here in the West is making very little of the anointing. Can you unpack that for me? Because This is a heavy conversation, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the anointing costs you something. Yeah. And what I'm afraid we did in the, in the pulpit is we started producing people who minimized the anointing that was on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And the reason is we didn't want to pay the price for the anointing. So we started telling people, uh, that's just emotionalism. That's just uh, what I, there's a, been a legalism, a, legalism, a plethora of adjectives and words that have been assigned to. I've watched people move in the anointing yeah. and, and people say that's uh, spiritual manipulation. That's not spiritual manipulation. A grown man doesn't make another grown man cry by, by spiritual manipulation. I've watched rooms shift because mm -hmm. of the anointing. I've watched yokes break because of the anointing. And what I'm afraid we, we, we came to the conclusion of we don't want to pay the price, so let's begin to minimize, or worse yet, criticize and scrutinize the anointing and say we don't have to have that. Just get up and teach uh, um, teach a truth. First of all, we should always teach the truth. Right. But you and I know there is a difference between ministering under the anointing and just ministering. Yes. I know that is a fact because... Jesus walked into a synagogue where the word of God was read daily. And they looked at, and he looked at them and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Watch, because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, set at liberty them that are bruised, and preach recovering of sight to the blind, to declare yes. the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. Watch this. Those scriptures had been read in that synagogue before, but the reality of it is Jesus... Uh, Jesus understood the anointing. So we'll talk about what that is in just a second. But the anointing was on him for the purpose of ministry. Mm -hmm. And I am concerned, uh, Keenan, I am concerned that we think we can do this in the power of, this, of our own strength and the, own, and the power of our flesh. Yeah. The anointing in the Old Testament that carries a, a, a meaning to it in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, they, they used nothing for God in the temple that did not have oil on it. Mm -hmm. Everything got anointed with oil. 
We practiced that in my church growing up, not even really understanding the revelation that we had oil on the doorpost and yeah. oil on the piano keys and oil. If you look everywhere, there was a fingerprint, well, a oily fingerprint somewhere because we had laid hands on every seat and we prayed and we anointed. And I know that people say, "Oh, that you know, that's so extra. That don't take all that." I, there's something about it worked. Mm. Something about it was honored by God. And I am, I am not afraid because I don't walk in the spirit of fear, but I am concerned at times that we've gotten cute and we've gotten so polished and we've gotten so, I don't even want to say edu- I love education. I don't think there is nothing like scholarship on fire, mm. but they got to have the fire Absolutely. and you got to have the oil. And I have preached with it and without it. I'd much rather have it. I'd much rather have it. More things get done when the oil is there. And Absolutely. so we, in the Old Testament, they would anoint the, the altar and they mixed the oil up and they anointed the brazen laver and they anointed the, all the utensils and everything in the temple was anointed with oil. David, before he became king, anointed with oil. Jehu, before he became king, they run in and pour oil from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's dripping with oil. And they walk, he walks out of this anointing and his friends look at him and say, what happened to you? And he said, nothing. And they said, you lie because you got oil all over you. The anointing will make you a different man. Mm. It said it came up on Saul. Saul. Even as crazy as Saul was, he was anointed. And then you come over in the New Testament. Jesus said you're anointed. John's gospel, or John's epistle rather. Yes. John says you have this anointing. Yes. So here's the deal. Do you want to minister in your own strength or do you want to minister with God's presence on your life, empowering you to do through his anointing what you could not do by yourself? To me, that's the simplest definition of the anointing. God's presence on a human life, empowering that life to do what it could not do in its own strength. Mm. Lord, minister beyond me. That's the anointing. Mm. Minister beyond my capacity, by my limitations, my abilities, my competency. I give all that to you. Now come on my life. And I don't know how else to explain it. It's not idiomatic language. It's real. I can feel the anointing. Mm. I, I, I don't understand yeah, it. Yeah, palpable. It's pal- it's uh, 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 I, I don't know, Pastor Parsley said, um, uh. it's transferable. I can feel it. And Jesus felt it. Yes, people people I mean, often miss this, but when the woman with the issue, issue of blood, blood touched him, he said, I felt virtue yes. leave me. Well, you know, what does that mean? I don't, I know what it means. I felt that too. I can lay hands on somebody and fill a brick wall at times. And they look at you while you pray for them. Yep. And you pat them on the shoulder, God bless you. I've also walked by people and lay my hand on them and in an instant know the sickness in their body. Whew in an instant know the stronghold on their life, in an instant know what God's doing in their family, and they make a demand on what God has put on your life, and they're pulling on it by faith. God, I need this anointing of the Holy Spirit. And yes, it's only a human person, and it's working through a human person, but it is not the possession of that human person for their own self. Jesus did not say, I'm anointed for me. Jesus said, I'm anointed for the blind, the sick, the hurting, those who need to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. My anointing's not for me and your anointing's not for you. It's for everyone in the circle of our influence. Absolutely, beautifully said. When it comes to, okay, getting the anointing, we understand Mm -hmm. we need it. What are some ways, practical ways, in which you can look back on your life and Mm -hmm. see, after I adopted this, Mm -hmm. I adhered to this, Mm -hmm. I made a discipline of this, Mm -hmm. there was a new anointing on my life. What are Mm -hmm. some things that you could say, people, like practical things you can point to that men of God can like, I can start doing that, I can start making a value of that. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I saw a new anointing, a fresh oil Mm -hmm. on our ministry. So I'll answer this in two layers, if that's okay. okay. However you want. Because I think there are discipline things that I had to say no to, things that I had to say yes to. Yeah. Decisions I had to make, especially in my late teens, early 20s. Yeah. And I do those things now, but back then it was was a sacrifice in a way that, that, um, I will say it this way as well. The anointing oil... I don't know that there's a practical three things I can tell you. Let me just say it this way. Okay. I went through a crushing. I went through some pain. Mm. I went through a personal wilderness. I went through, um, I went through a, a John, a Saint, a John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. Mm. I, no, none of your listeners want to hear this, but this, this is, you survive some things to walk in the anointing. You, mm. you, 
you go through some seasons of betrayal to walk in the anointing. You, wow. You want to know when Jesus got a fresh anointing? Jesus got a fresh anointing after Judas had went and sold him. Uh, it, you don't want to do when Jesus got a fresh anointing. He goes in a 40-day wilderness. The Bible said he walked in the wilderness in the spirit. He came out of the wilderness in the power. Wow. The wilderness, the wilderness, you know, nobody's like, oh, I want to run to the wilderness. I can only tell you this. The men of God and the women of God in your life and my life that we know are anointed, I don't care what they look like with a microphone in their right. hand. If there's an oil on their life, they've been through some stuff. Absolutely. They've been through Gethsemane. Jesus is in Gethsemane. I've been there many times. And he is sweating until his sweat turns into drops of blood. The most immense pressure that a human being had ever experienced as he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. And he says, Father, let this cup pass from me if it's possible. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. There's Gethsemane is a crushing. It means a crushing. The place where the mm -hmm. olive is crushed. You don't get to the oil without the crushing. And so when I see someone who's anointed, I honor them. I, I don't even care. They may have a slightly different, and I'm not talking about orthodoxy. Right, right, right. But, but there may be a slight difference in their, some of their theological underpinnings, and, and, and they may have a, a slightly different interpretation of this. But you know when the anointing is in the room. Absolutely. And when it's on the person. When I see that, I say, oh, they have a history with God. Mm -hmm. They have walked through some things with God. And so my I can't testify for everyone watching. I can tell you the disciplinary things that I do in just a mo did in just a moment, but I can tell you this. Every new level of fresh anointing was preceded by some type of crushing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that is a difficult thing to talk about because I told my church family this past week I was preaching on what God had called us to do. And mm. God didn't show me the details, Keenan. God gave me what I would call a big commercial, just a high level dream. I had a dream when I was 17 years old. In the dream, God showed me a high level commercial of what my life would look like. We would, we would see the head of a snake cut off and rain would fall from heaven. Rain fell from heaven so fast in this dream. It, it piled up on top of itself and I woke, woke up and the water was over my head in my dream. And I woke up, my mama said, I prayed in the spirit, laid in my bed, wailing in the spirit for hours. And I didn't know any of that. I just knew the dream. I never forgot the dream. Wow. I remember the dream, with, and to this day, with such vivid detail. God showed me the big picture. He didn't show me the people issues and the betrayal. He didn't mm -hmm. show me the pain and the night where you don't sleep and the, and the stuff you go through. Yeah. If... You're really anointed. You've been crushed. Yeah. And and that's where the oil comes from. Now, you can protect the anointing. Mm -hmm. You can sustain the anointing. You can even, I really believe, you can, uh, through honor, you can attract greater anointing because what you honor, you attract. Amen. And if you dishonor the anointing, you don't ever have to worry about having it. Yeah. God doesn't give it to those who dishonor it. He yeah. really doesn't. But in terms of receiving it and walking in it, it was something, I, when I was at Lee, I was a 17 year old kid. I, my freshman year at Lee, there was a dorm, room 111, Hughes Hall. It was next to my room, it was empty, there was a closet. I spent more time in that closet in prayer than I did anywhere else on that campus Wow! for my first year. And I was walking through a night season of my soul. I can't explain it other than to tell you, for almost two years, I was, I fought off suicide, I fought off feelings that God didn't love me. I fought off lies of the enemy. It was as if yeah. the enemy had an entrance into my my thinking and I didn't yeah. have the authority to overthrow him. And when God broke me through that, I I can't explain to you, it was just the Holy Spirit that broke through yeah. and an oil come on my life and I've never been the same since, really. Wow. I'm not telling you I've been perfect or anything like that. I'm not telling you I haven't had other seasons. I'm telling you when that breakthrough came, it was a breakthrough that in one just three day period, my entire life was flipped upside down for the rest of my life. Doors started flying open, things started happening and destiny, uh, as it were, the word destiny, um, uh, it just got unlocked. Praise and, God. And so it, it was, so I would say the fresh oil is preceded by some sort of, some sort of uh, 
presence of the enemy, attack of the, I don't want to glorify the devil. No, for sure. I understand. He never wins. No. He never wins. But he always regrets what he did to you. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. In regards, that was so beautiful. You mentioned this commercial that God gave you. Yeah. It's high level, quick, 30 second, Mm -hmm. whatever it felt like snippet Mm -hmm. of like, here's what can happen. Mm Mm-hmm. Almost like just a prophetic dream mm-hmm. of like what your life would become. It, it was. Absolutely. So many people, especially, and you said, how old were you at that time? 17. 17 years old. I remember being 17 years old, 18 years old, having these dreams and visions of being this preacher mm-hmm. that um, touched the world. Wow. That, you know, I, tra- like I would travel the world, that I would go to all the major conferences that I would watch my favorite preachers preach at, all those things, which none of those dreams are wrong. None of those right. desires are wrong. Right. But I was full of this vision, full of this excitement, full of this, like, God, I, I, want, you to, I want you to just blow my life up. I want to preach, and I don't want to <laughs> preach small. I don't want to preach in, just in small places. I know it's going to look small now, yeah. but like, I want, I want the arenas. I want the stadiums. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And my heart still burns for that. Sure. Um, but... Over 10 years later, the, some of those things sure have happened, and many of them have still not transpired. Uh, mm-hmm. For What I want to ask is, I know no doubt when you were young, 17 years old, mm-hmm. when God gave you that snippet of what things could look, look like, it wasn't on a small scale. No. It's not, hey, preach to 12 people for the rest of your life. And I am not minimizing preaching to 12 people. Jesus did most of his preaching to just 12 dudes. Sure, um, But none of us want to just stay small. None of us just want the little, you know, um, classroom setting. We we see ourselves in halls and arenas and, um, you know, sanctuaries that are large. What do you do? So I've heard it said, you know, a lot of the time a prophet, they see mountaintops, Mm -hmm. but they don't always know the distance between the peaks. Wow. Right. There's, there's not always a lot of clarity between how long is it going to take to transpire for you being at that. And I really feel like as I'm watching you, God is really, even in the last maybe year, year and a half, two mm-hmm. years, God has just been giving influence like never yeah. before, at least in my opinion, just yeah. watching yeah. Um, from the outside. I'm sure some of that has been alive in your heart for a very long time. Yeah. What does that look like to walk out knowing, God, I know these big things are ahead of me, even just like numerically. Hey, mm-hmm. I want to preach to X amount of people. I want to preach at this place. Yeah. I want to even maybe some relationships. You're like, man, I, Lord, I'd love it if you opened a door for me to be in relationship with that man or wow. that woman. Mm. What does it look like? What's a healthy balance of having those desires and wanting those things to transpire, but also staying in the timeline of God and in the will of God and not chasing numbers, opportunities, friendships, those things? Yeah, great question. I'm, I'm thinking about, as you asked the question, I'm thinking about what the Gospel of St. John said about a man named John the Baptist. It said... Uh, and he hid in the. He went to the wilderness until the time of his revelation mm. to Israel. He he literally intentionally hid in the wilderness until the time of his revelation to Israel. Mm. I've I have we have all of us have watched the unfortunate demise of men and women for that matter who have been promoted prematurely. Yes. I have never, you ready for this? I'm 44. I started pastoring this church when I was 22. So I've been pastoring 20. You started pastoring this church at 22 years old. Yeah, 34 people. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, My God. So here's the deal. You ready for this? I can tell you this. And and now we have, you know, four campuses. Well, if you count his, uh, international campus, we've got a sixth campus. So, you know, thousands yeah, of people. Okay, absolutely. But, here, but here's the deal. We never had this. We We, we never did this. It's been 22 years of just by the help of God, this. Okay. Okay. I take that. I take that all day long. And let me tell you why. Because I watched pride. Mm -hmm. I know in my own life and in my own season, as slow as our growth and steady as we have been, there have been seasons where I thought I had the world by the tail. And I thought, man, we kick and tail. We know what we're doing now. Yeah. And that lasts about uh, 30 seconds. And then reality, somebody <laughs> yes. call you and remind you, you ain't all you think you are. You know, just the emails the, 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 all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But I'll take this. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and you should take this. 
Everybody should take this because what I've seen is very few. I'm not saying never. I'm not saying this conclusively or 100%. I'm telling you 99% of the time, men who go like this, we watch a train wreck. Mm -hmm. we, we see some sort of train wreck. And, and, and the reason why is this. It's like the people that they say you win the lottery. Yeah. And then three years you're bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you didn't work the necessary muscles to learn how to handle the weight of that money. Yeah. Of that money. And I get concerned sometimes when people get popular. Mm. Please hear me. Yeah. Jesus ran from it. He ran from it. Wow. He, I, you, you can't point me to a place where he embraced the crowd calling him the man. You the man, you the man. You know what he'd do? I'm running to the, I'm going back to the father. I'm getting away from these crazy people. It's true. We don't like to hear that. No. Now hear me. On the other side, Peter had to preach on Pentecost and thousands came into the kingdom. Yeah. And my, you know, I, I, there are people in my life who believe Timothy preached and pastored Ephesus and it was a mega church, right? Thousands and thousands of people now in different ways than we would call it a mega church now, but still thousands and thousands of people. Love so I'm not against growth. Please, Absolutely. please understand Jesus. Uh, Jesus was not afraid of the crowd. I am not afraid of the crowd. Metrically, I'm not afraid of numbers. I'm not afraid of growth. I'm not. Right. In, I'm not been not intimidated. I don't accuse people who are growing quickly of being a compromiser. Right. I don't. I don't get into the. I believe God's in, will for our life is to have influence, to use influence for His glory, and to increase in that influence. But hear me. The most important thing is not that influence. It is intimacy that creates influence. Absolutely. And if you, in the moment of your influence, lose intimacy, and you start looking at the trajectory of the growth that you're experiencing, and you start saying, I'm doing it. I'm do what are you doing? What are you doing? You're doing what you thought was successful, but you're losing what made you successful. Wow. And that is a relationship with God. And so sometimes we see this, and we all of a sudden, Year later, six months later, God forbid to we have we have a crash and burn. Now the good news is that God is a God of mercy and people can get up and go forward. Absolutely. The issue, however, is this those who pursue premature promotion and those who will sacrifice what I would call kingdom principles or or uh, uh, really components of truth, foundational truth, to get this dream. Mm -hmm. They don't usually get to keep the fruit of it. Wow. Because it wasn't about the fruit. It was about the accomplishment. And God is really not into me or you having some self-aggrandizing experience where we say, we conquered and we did it. Oh, no, we did it. God did it. And the moment we start thinking we did it is when we start losing it. Absolutely. When I had the dream, when I had the dream, this, this, this formational dream that really became the catalyst of my life, I was a 17-year-old kid. I was in a jungle. I knew in the spirit, by the spirit, the jungle was downtown Chattanooga. Wow. It was the thickest jungle I'd ever been in in my life. And I had a machete in my hand. And I start cutting down trees and leaves. And I turn around and my mom and my daddy are following me. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I'm 17, my mom and daddy following me. What y'all doing? I just keep cutting down stuff. I turn around, Sunday school teacher following me. I keep cutting it. I turn around, friends from high school following me through the jungle. I keep cutting jungle. I turn around, there's a hundred people. Then I cut some more jungle, turn around, a thousand people. Keep cutting jungle, turn around. There's people that so far behind me are following. I can't see the end of the line. Wow. And they're all in this jungle with me. Suddenly in the dream, a snake falls down out of a tree. It was so real in the dream. The eyes, I can still see the eyes of the snake. Feel his tongue on my nose in the, snake. In the dream. It was weird. And I paralyzed in fear. And I remembered I have a sword. Mm. And I pulled a sword out, wham, hit the snake. The snake's head cuts off. When the snake's head hits the floor, the ground, it starts raining. The heavens opened up. It starts raining. And the water piled up on top of itself. And the last thing I remember in the dream, the water was over my head. And I woke up and wailing in the spirit. My mom said, you was praying, praying. And I said, God, what was this dream? And here's what he said at 17. Wow. You will pastor a church in Chattanooga. You will cut a head of, of a snake off. I know now that snake represented two things, racism and religion. Wow. I, I don't chase a bunch of other assignments, but I came for, by the help of God, on an assignment from God, 
not because I was ambitious about it, but because I wanted to see that snake's head come off. I knew God had called me to address issues of racism and religion in the church. And it's, wow. prim- it's primarily what I preach. It's primarily what I talk I mean, about. Yeah, that definitely without a doubt. And, and, and when that snake's head hit the ground, it rained. And the point is this. When I've had my lowest points, Keenan, mm. I have to go remember that dream. I have to wow. go remember that dream. And it's formational. And so I never went pursuing that line of people. You know what I did? I just swung my sword. Yeah. Just swing your sword. If you'll swing the sword, God will send you every person that you need. Wow. Yeah. Swing your sword. Maybe, yeah, exactly. Maybe the problem isn't <laughs> people aren't showing up. Maybe it's that you're not swinging your sword. Yeah. yeah. Good grief. I want to kind of, there's so many places I'd like to, and so many questions I'd like to ask you. <laughs> but I want to pivot because I really think this is going to be practical. And you and I have never talked about this, but I, I, feel like, I feel like there's a lot to be said here. And I really feel like you can speak to this. When it comes to answering the call to ministry, yeah. but also bearing the financial burden okay. of family yeah. and generational wealth yeah. that the scriptures call us to, sure. right? Proverbs 13, yeah. calling us to generational wealth. Yes, sir. Wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. 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 Yes, sir. Um, a lot of people want to interpret that scripture as that's a spiritual inheritance. Mm-hmm. But the, the latter portion of that same scripture mm-hmm. says, and the wealth of the wicked is laid yeah. up for the righteous. So what spiritual inheritance is laid up for the righteous. There's not one. They have no spiritual inheritance, right, but a right. lake which burns with fire. Right. So it's talking about money, it right? Is. It's talking about, in the Bible terms, cattle, property, all the things. It is. How do you balance yeah. saying yes to God, yeah. being completely devoted to your calling, but also being a man who knows how to do what the Bible says, which the Bible says he has given us mm-hmm. the ability to create wealth, create yeah. it. Yep. Can you speak to that? Yeah. To somebody out there who's like, man, I, I want to serve God, but like, how do I, I, I don't want to just make ends meet. I want to, oh, yeah. I want to thrive financially. And I do. And I want my family to, and I would Amen. tell you, I'm going to tell you the first step and I can tell you st- things I think that are steps beyond it. But the first step for a, let's just say a senior leader or a pastor of a church, yeah. l- your future is not exclusively found in that offering pan. Wow. Now, if you don't know that, you'll manipulate that. Mm-hmm. You will turn that season and time in a service of giving into some pressure because you feel like your entire future is in that offering pan. Wow. And I made my mind up in a very early age that nobody will be my source. Wow. I don't say that arrogantly. No, for sure. I say that I, at 20 years old, I was an associate pastor for a year and a half, and I made $24,000 a year. A year. Wow. I was married. My wife had just had Jeremiah. Um, I was making $24,000 a year, preached maybe, if I was lucky, four times a year in some other place. And if I made $1,000 in all those places, I might have made $30,000 a year. And I'm talking about total income. I'm wow. not talking about salary plus housing on the side. I'm right. That was, I lived on WIC, which is essentially glorified, yes. glorified food stamps. And I remember this test. Yeah. Here we go. Um. It was tithe time. Jeremiah had a kidney stone issue as a baby, an okay. infant, a newborn. He had seven kidney stones in his kidney. Wow. Couldn't get, keep food down. We didn't know why. And he drank only one milk. It was the most expensive milk you can find. It's called Nutramagen. <laughs> okay. And it was back then, it was like, it was the dough, bro. It was $30, or $40 a can. He couldn't drink Similac, which was $10 a can. My he had Lord. to have $50 can of, 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 of this Nutramagen. And I'm like, God, heal him because I can't afford this. Yeah. I remember going to Devin and saying, Devin, if we pay our tithes. Now, somebody's going to fall out with me on this, but that's okay. I lived this. I said, if we pay our tithes, I don't know how we're going to buy this month's formula for Jeremiah. And she goes, what are you thinking? And I said, I'm going to pay our tithes because I trust God to be my source. This is the truth before God. I was 21 years old when this happened. The next day, I walked out. I paid my tithes that day. The next day, nobody knew that but me and Devin and God, which is all you have to know. The next day, I walked out on my front porch. To this day, I don't know where it came from. There was a pallet of Nutramagen. I am talking not about three or four cans. I am talking about 
so many cans it lasted him till he didn't need Neutramogen anymore. Oh, my word. I, to this day, don't know where it came from. I know God sent it. Absolutely. And I made up my mind that day, that day, my future financially will not be tied to the offering pan of my church. I am not suggesting that a church shouldn't take care of the ox that treads out the corn. Absolutely. Don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. That is a scripture. That's not my opinion. It's what Paul said, right? Churches ought to bless the pastor. And I know that I'm, I'm very judicious in saying that because I am a pastor. And I'm, right. I'm not preaching to my congregation. I would never say that to my congregation, but I'm talking to other people who have a congregation or in a congregation for their pastor. You have a responsibility to bless. And in fact, the Bible said, give them double. Yeah, it's true. Right. It's with, with double with, owner, yeah. With, 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 which we really fall out with, and you get a whole lot of haters. Yes. Especially on the outside of the church that don't understand, don't understand spiritual principle. Yeah. I don't demand double. You don't demand anything. I do this all for the Lord. But here's the point. I never put my financial future in, in, the, in the offering pan. I always said to God, you're much bigger than that. Yeah. I'm grateful for a church that's been kind to us. But I can testify to you at 36 years old, by the blessing of God only, I was debt free. Praise God. House paid for. Um, that was a miracle. And it was so supernatural how God did it. It freaked me out. And I can just testify, Keenan. Yeah. You will be able to leave an inheritance for your children's children, which is substantial, by the way. Yes. But you don't have to look at that and feel the pressure of how am I going to get that out of a congregation? Your responsibility is to pour it into the congregation. Yeah. And God will take care of you in your house. It's one idea. It might be a business entrepreneurial thing that comes on you, an invention. It might be an inheritance you weren't waiting on. It might be. Right. There's a bunch of millions of ways that this can happen. Right. The reality of it is generosity is my decision. Prosperity mm. is God's response to my decision. Wow. If I'll be generous, God will prosper you. I, wow. You say that's the prosperity gospel. You call it whatever you, you want. want to. Yeah. You, I, I, I don't call it that because I think the prosperity gospel was manipulation. Yes. This is not manipulation. I am simply telling you God will owe no man anything. Yes. You may hate my harvest, but you don't know my seed. Wow. And before you criticize people because of what they're harvesting and what God's doing for them, and we all have haters, yeah. but before you criticize someone because of their harvest, you might want to pause at least for five seconds and let the, the truth permeate your religious mind that God could have done that. Right. Which means you don't have a problem with me. You actually have a problem with the favor and the kindness of God. Right. And there are people who have an issue with God being good to people, and I don't have that issue. I pray you and Beth are multimillionaires. Amen. I, I do. It. I, I, it. I pray August and his children inherit farms and land and property and resources. And you say, oh, that's the prosperity gospel. How would you feel if I said, I hope everybody in your family dies broke? Anybody who would rejoice over that, I don't even know if they're saved. I would, yes, yes. I don't even know if they're saved. So we don't want to talk about manipulation. No. But I'm telling you, God honors generosity with prosperity. Yes. And when the Lord, the Bible said that the blessing of the Lord can make you rich and he will add no, no sorrow. sorrow to it. There is a way to get wealthy and have lots of sorrow. Oh, absolutely. But, and we know many people that way. Yeah. Loaded in their bank account, bankrupt in their spirit. Yeah. Because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink and banking accounts. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Ghost. So on. the reality of it is you can have money and be broke and bankrupt spiritually. Conversely, you can be full of God, full of joy, full of his righteousness, and have a fullness of blessing and prosperity in your bank account. And God is willing to let you have it if you won't let it have you. Wow. So I don't have time for Pharisees who criticize, you know, uh, you a preacher, you're supposed to be broke. You can't show me that in the Bible, number one. Number two, you have no clue how I got what I got. Absolutely. God did it. And I mean, that, there, there's an argument to be made that Paul even says, like, he, he's kind of having to give this rebuke of, we sowed into you spiritually. It is not wrong for us to expect to reap 
monetarily. Monetar- he said monetarily. That. Can you imagine if you're in the day of Jesus? Now, people are crazy, but just imagine a, a Jesus walking into church at giving time on Sunday and wow. standing there watching at the altar as you bring your gift to the altar. We bring our offering and tithe to the Lord in our church, and we put the offering receivers on the stage. And can you imagine Jesus standing there watching people give? Because the Bible said in the book of Luke, he watched what they gave and knew the amount they put in. It's true. That makes everyone uncomfortable. Jesus doesn't care about money. The reality of it is Jesus talks substantially about it. About possessions. Yeah. Not because, not because he needed or wanted their possessions. I personally believe that when the wise men this is a whole other word. I don't know if you want to go down this road, but I could go down this road. I would love to. L- l- listen to this. When Jesus is born, the wise men come. We always tell everybody there's three. There were three wise men, and they come with a little bag of frankincense, golden myrrh, hogwash. When these wise men came from the east, conservatively, there were 70. Most people believe there were hundreds. The Bible wow. said, watch this. The Bible said that they brought coffers to Jesus. It literally, or the, and some translations say boxes. The Greek is, it was, a, it was a box like a casket, and they were full of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Here's what I believe with all my heart. Don't miss this. When the wise men came and dropped this off to Jesus, he was, an, he was not a newborn baby. Right. We know he was in the house. They had moved at some way, in some way to a temporary place. And they're in a house, and he, they come in and they see the child, Jesus. So I think he's probably two, maybe three. He's not an infant. He's not at the manger anymore. Right. He's in a house. Watch this. They fund Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And what's the next thing that's talked about? Right. They go where? To Egypt. Egypt. Why? Because as it is written... Yes. A voice crying, Rama, and 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 they yes. they, they, they attack. Rachel weeping for her children. Rachel weeping for her children. Watch this. The Old Testament prophesied Jesus, the Messiah, would have to be taken to Egypt in order to finance prophecy being fulfilled. Wow. God brought riches from the wise men to fund fulfillment of prophecy. prophecy. Hear me. God is not. He is not El Chipo. He is El Shaddai. Let's go. He has every, he owns it all. Heaven is not crawling with dollar bills with Ben Franklin on them. Right. Heaven doesn't, heaven doesn't uh, operate in American currency. Right. It doesn't operate in euros or yen or, or pounds. Heaven, heaven operates in one thing, provision. Whatever your need is. For the woman in the uh, in the Old Testament, she didn't need dollar bills. She right. needed oil. Right. For, we could go through the line. Yes. For us, sometimes we need cash. We need we need money. But sometimes we just need the washer and dryer to last. Sometimes we need right. the car to keep working. Sometimes we whatever provision is, he'll take care of you. And I just believe with all my heart, God. New tramogen. New, I was going. You read my mind. Sorry. New, it was beautiful. New tramogen. God knew what I needed. Yes. Here's the thing. If he can give me enough nutrimogen to feed my son throughout his, 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 his infanthood. Wow. He can provide the dollars I need, the house I need, the car I need. The, he can take care of it. And he has people all the time. Where did you get those shoes? Somebody gave, somebody gave them to me. Right. I don't, even, I don't even know where some of these shoes come from. Yeah. I don't even wear them long. But, you know, people hate all about you for everything. And I say to myself, one time I said to myself, I'm not going to wear these shoes because people will say something. And I felt as if the Lord said to me, if you don't wear those shoes, I'm not going to touch someone's heart to give them to you anymore. Because, oh, because dang. think about this. Yeah, that's true. Why would the Lord touch someone's heart to bless me and I wouldn't walk in the blessing? Literally walk in the blessing. Literally, in a very physical way, walk in the (laughs) blessing. I don't flaunt and, you know, I don't like look at my shoes. I just say, Lord, thank you. Absolutely. I remember buying shoes for an evangelist when I was a young man. He didn't need my shoe money. I bought him him a pair of shoes, a couple hundred dollars. I bought one pair of shoes and I keep harvesting shoes. I sold one pair of shoes and I and I bless people with shoes all the time. You bless it, me with some shoes. I, I got be, kicks on right now. You got kicks on. Here's the deal. What's the you know, that's so weird. No, it's not weird. I'm generous. If you don't like it, that's fine. Yeah. But I'm generous. And I want to be generous for the rest of my life. And I I am a blessed man. Yeah. By the grace of God. And I can tell you, like Paul said, I haven't 
Uh, I haven't cheated anyone out of anything. I've just shared the word and I've yes. walked in faithfulness as best I can. And God's been good to our family. I hope that wasn't too long. No, no, I wanted you to go in depth in that. I mean, the, the scripture speaks to this. You know, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. What it says. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. It's yes, not sir. that when you're stingy, you just are stuck with what you got. Somehow what you got slips out of your hand. It's true. Um, in the same breath that we're talking, we're really, in a sense, I didn't even mean for it to go this way, but I'm really happy we're going there. We're kind of coming at this prosperity gospel thing. Mm-hmm. There is a prosperity gospel sure. that is toxic. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That has been used, as you've already said, to manipulate, to... I mean, a friend of mine told me a story about he was with a man, and they were behind... I don't even know who the man was. He didn't share it with me. But they were overseas, and he was serving the man. And they were going to the meeting, and he was in the car, and he said, tonight we're going to put their hand in one pocket. We're going to put our hand in one of their pockets. Tomorrow night we'll put our hand in the other one. And my friend literally asked them to pull the car over and got out of the car. I believe it was in Germany and like called his dad and had him fly him home. Like he was so grieved over it. That exists. And that has happened. We're not trying to make light of that. We're not trying to make light of greedy pastors, No, but the Bible does speak of prosperity of God prospering. you. Honestly, that's part of the gospel package, right? It's part of what Jesus died for. Um, That same camp. And I'll just put it that way that wants to attack this prosperity gospel thing. And it's funny, I've been called a prosperity gospel preacher and have like never talked about money, ever. <laughs> like, like they can't find a clip of me talking about it, right. but they're like, oh, prosperity gospel. I'm like, what are, we just, <laughs> they just throw that around. Like anything they don't like, prosperity right. gospel. Um, it's and true. The, it's true. It's, it's like, true. I didn't, it wasn't even talking about money. What are you talking about? Yeah. In the same breath, that same camp tend to be the one who are, perpetuating cessationism. Oh, yeah. Cessationism. I saw an advertisement recently for the cessationist conference. Pay $300 to come and hear about cessationism. Which is ridiculous to me. <laughs> Especially being at the same camp who wants to talk about the prosperity gospel and you're charging $300 to come and listen to cessationists. You're preaching better than I'm shouting. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I would love if you would come. I feel like... like cessationism is trying to gain ground right now. I'm seeing it on social media. I'm seeing um, it perpetuated. If you could speak, I know you are not a cessationist. The <laughs> gifts are flowing here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah. If you could speak to that, the modern day use of the, the gifts of the spirit, especially <clears throat> in the local church, like expressed in the local church, if you could speak to that. It's just interesting to me how we pick and choose. Yeah. What, what we want what uh what we want to pay attention to and then and then the um uh, i think the severe hermeneutic injustice we do yeah when we find something we don't like the severe hermeneutic injustice and the interpretive mechanism that we use when we read scripture we suddenly manipulate the scripture to to say something that fits in our cessationistic ideologies wow and um he, he, here's Here's what I will. Here's what I will say to you. Um, the people who, first of all, we can agree on this. We can agree that no one, not one of us, wants strange fire. Right. No. 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 Can, no. can I? Can I tell you something? The same people. I don't care. I love them all. I would say this if they were sitting at the table. I would preach this to them if they were sitting in my church. Um, the same people who are having that conference had a conference. 10 years ago called Strange Fire. Yes. I got so grieved Mm -hmm. when I saw that conference and I heard the content of that conference Mm -hmm. that I went home and wept till 3 a.m. and birthed a conference called Ruach. No way. Ruach was the result of of Strange Fire. Strange Fire. I did not know that. Nobody knows that. I've never shared that before. Wow. Wow. You got it on your podcast for the first time. This is some proprietary information here. Yes, it is. I'm happy about it. I wept till 3 a.m. in the morning. Wow. And I said, Lord, I'm so discouraged because we literally have people who have taken the authentic. Now, again, strange fire is a real thing. Right. Moses' boys. Nadab and Abihu yep. built a fire, and it was strange, and and, and it brought judgment. And yes. I, God forbid a man be enticed or invited into in, uh, operating in strange fire. Right. 
But God forbid that we forget the church was birthed in holy fire. fire. The Bible said cloven tongues like fire sat up on each of them. Hebrews yes. said, our God is a consuming fire. Uh, yes. John the Revelator saw him and he had feet like brass and eyes like fire. And what we have created is a fireless church. Through our cessationism, wow. we have promoted a dead, dry formalism that contains truth but has no manifestation of the truth's power that we are preaching. Wow. Paul would say to the church, if we had time, I, again, I, this thing gets in me and I Let's can't turn go. it off. I don't want you to. In the, book of, in the book of Acts, and I'll try to keep my chronology right here, he goes to Athens and Paul ascends to the hill of the uh, er- er- Eragopolis, and he begins to pontificate with the uh, societal poets of Athens, and he's pontificating and speaking the deep things, and he's quoting the Athenian poets. You know, we always quote that scripture, and everybody shouts uh, 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 that in him we live, move, and have our being. That wasn't a Christian phrase. It was was, a poet. Yeah. It was an Athenian poet. And so Paul goes to Athens, and he attempts to ascend in some uh, mental and uh, some some real, you know, a brainy way to connect with the Athenian poets. He thinks, I need to get on their wavelength, and I need to speak their language. So he goes to the uh, the Oropagus, and he stands on the Athenian heel, and he's pontificating with the poets, and one person gets saved. Wow. Now, I invite you to go to the book of Corinthians, where he went after he left Athens. Read it. It's in Acts. When he got to the church at Corinth, he said, when I came to you, I saved, uh, in what he was saying in the King James Version, he said, I saved, I would know nothing, but he was saying, I determined. I wasn't coming to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Yeah. Why did he say that? Because he tried that in Athens, and the results sucked. (laughs) <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. It's great. They were horrible. He didn't get the breakthrough. Why? Because he was trying to operate on their wavelength. When he got to Corinth, I think he came to himself and said, What am I doing? I don't get results by enticing words of man's wisdom. Wow. But the demonstration of the Spirit's power. Wow. Cessationism wants to preach a truth, but doesn't want to permit the Spirit to manifest the power locked up in the truth. Wow. Hear me. Jesus did not come simply to give us a religious Band-Aid yes. and a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's as if we preach salvation, people get saved, and then, I mean, think about it. Cessationism is essentially some ways tied to um, Reformed theology, yes. and, and, and we're almost persuaded to believe as we listen to that, that evangelism is really sort of unnecessary because God's already willed who will be saved right. and who, and so we're confused. We just do it out of obedience just, to Christ. Yeah, yeah, we just do it out of obedience to Christ. Well, thank God for the obedience to Christ. Right. But you go read the book of Acts. This were not pontificating men that floated from place to place, you know, uh, trying to uh, use some uh, persuasive arguments. In fact, the book of Acts says they were not educated men. Right. But men took note that they had been with Jesus. Yes. Everywhere they go, it was revival or riot. Everywhere they go, there's this, uh, I think of, uh, what is it, Acts 8 or 10 there, where a whole city gets delivered and you could hear cries of people being freed from demonic spirits. And you're trying to tell me that decades after Acts chapter 2, men are still being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We heard it last night. Yes. Acts 19, 24 years after yeah. Acts 2. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? We didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost. Here's the point. My point is this. Cessationism doesn't have a strong leg to stand on. No. Theologically, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm going to get blistered for this, but I'm good with it. Theologically, you can say don't build strange fire, and we can concur on that. Yeah. Not everything that happens in Pentecostal charismatic churches yes. is sanctioned or ordained or Absolutely. blessed by God. Call it out, correct it, apostolically lead it, put prophets in order, let foolishness cease, let Christ be glorified, let the yeah. Spirit of the Lord move. But do not stand up and preach a resurrected Christ who is impotent now and his spirit is somehow hidden and withdrawn and we don't know what he's doing. Men and women and families are in the yoke of bondage and it doesn't take some cute presentation of the gospel to get them out. It takes the power of the resurrection power of Jesus to break these yokes. And I see the gifts of the Spirit. I know this sounds whatever, but I see it as if it were like little 
spiritual bombs that blow up the enemy's plan. It destroys the enemy's plan. Word of prophecy, bam, bam. breakthrough, dry bones live. Word of knowledge, where is your husband? Uh, uh, I have had five. I don't have a husband. Rightly, you've said you don't have a husband. You've had five, and the one he's with is not your husband. Think right. of that. She had five. She was with six, but Jesus was number, number seven. seven. And when he comes into the mix, he's completion. He brings the search to an end. My point is this. All the gifts of the Spirit were manifest in Jesus. Every time they manifested, a life was transformed. Wow. I have no desire to manifest the gifts of the Spirit for my own personal aggrandizing or celebration. I want to have the gifts of the Spirit operative in my church because they disrupt every plan of darkness. Jesus, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yes. And there are people who would say, oh, this is so bizarre and radical. As if we get saved and and the only thing we do is have to suffer till we get to heaven. Listen, I've suffered, mm -hmm. but I've also experienced the goodness of God. And David said, I would have fainted had I not believed I would see the goodness of God. Not in heaven. In the land of the In the land of the living. And in the land of the living, we have a lot of hurting, broken people. Wow. And they need the breakthrough of God, the miracle of God, the blessing of God, the touch of God, the yes. work of the Spirit. So to my cessation is friends. And I call them friends. And yes, I, absolutely. I'm not even, they're my brothers. I know that people, you know, they, they would say probably for me that I, I, I'm a bit much and they don't know if I'm going to heaven. Well, that, that's between me and God and not you and me. So the reality of it is this. They love Jesus, so I'm not willing to say yes. they're not saved. Absolutely. I, I, I believe they're saved. I believe they're on their way to heaven. I believe they could have so much more joy and be so much more used by God on their way. Mm -hmm. And what I'm not going to do with a, a cessationist thought process is put a lid or a limit on God. Really what it boils down to is two things, control and fear. Yeah. We don't yeah. let the Holy Spirit work because we don't like to lose control. And we don't let the Holy Spirit work because we're afraid of something crazy happening. Right. I, people, listen, the gospel is crazy. Absolutely. We believe in a man who died and rose three days. He's coming back again. Yes. Riding a white horse, open his mouth, destroy all the uh, enemies yes. of it. It's crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, at the, people who don't believe, we could go here too. I'm loving this conversation, by the way. <laughs> you are a wealth of knowledge. I'm trying to shut up. No, please do not. That's the whole point of this. Um, but people who want to pick and choose which parts of the scripture we should adhere to and which part we shouldn't. Um, really what I'm trying to get at is people, and I, I think I know where you fall in this. I, actually, I do know where you fall in this, but people who are not total inerrancy yeah. people, I, I at that point, I cannot understand why we even find the Bible relevant at all. Yeah. If the Bible isn't inerrant, right. then how do you know? Yeah, how do, oh, well, I like the parts about Jesus. Okay, you just like it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they got what Jesus, I think they got Jesus right. But you don't think they got everything else right. Jesus, oh, look at it. He believed that the the uh, Torah was scripture. Mm -hmm. The Absolutely. Tanakh, oh yes, was scripture. Absolutely. That the Septuagint was, was right. scripture. Sure, he believed it. Absolutely. So you can't receive Jesus and not receive the right. fact that he also believed that these Old Testament books right. uh, were scripture. But then also the people who you know wrote down for us what we've read about Jesus. They believed Paul and the other epistles we have in the New Testament were Scripture. So 100%. you're going to believe what they had to say about Jesus, but you're going to believe what they believed about these other books. Right. That, that just doesn't, that doesn't make it, a ton it, of it, sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, even just from a logical basis, you like take faith out of the equation. Just from a, lo a logistical standpoint, it doesn't make sense to me. What would you say to people? And we could get into deconstruction here, all sorts of sure. things. People who want to attack, you know, I've heard people say, because uh, one of the big things, especially even in the Apostles' Creed, is that Jesus would be born of a virgin. Yeah. They want to attack the virgin birth. And sure. they want to make it out to be that Isaiah 714, it was a mistranslation, that it's not mm -hmm. actually born of a virgin, but it should have been born of a young woman, yeah. right? Yeah. But that word uh, young woman can be translated virgin. Here's the crazy thing. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they translated it to the Greek word, yep. virgin. They it did. cannot be mistaken as young woman. No. It is virgin. There's 100%. one word for it. The Septuagint was translated before Jesus was born. Right. So it's not in light of the fact that we've got this Jesus guy, we need to make the Old Testament fit him. Right. 
It was already translated Before that way. Here. But if people aren't biblically literate, they won't know that. And they'll be like, oh, well, I guess then Jesus, like this whole virgin thing is a crock. How do, how, how do we combat that? Like the biblical illiteracy, um, people who don't believe in the total inerrancy of, the, of Scripture. Yeah. Where do we go? Well, here's the deal. Total inerrancy, uh, when we come to that, it, that's, the I think, the, the premier conversation to have. That is the launching pad for the rest of the conversations right. we're having. Yes. If you believe that the Bible is somewhat inerrant, but not totally inerrant, then as you have said appropriately so, why do we believe any of it? Right. Okay, so, uh, and and we can talk about the canonization of Scripture. Right. We can talk about the qualifications for which the books of the Bible were included in the canon. We can mm -hmm. talk about apostolic authority and the succession of the apostolic authority and how it was connected to Jesus and the eyewitness, et cetera. There's, there's, there's all of those things that are germane and pertinent, but for me and for you and for most of our people who are listening, I think the, the matter of the, the issue that is the, the, the real crux of it all is when you pick up to read the Bible, is it the word of God or is it just another book? And if you don't come to it believing that it is with great veracity, it is the truth of God, it is absolutely accurate from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. The revelation is 100% accurate. The, in, the, uh, the translation, there may be some translated issues right. in translations where something is lost, but the reality of it is... Um, we we can't sit down, I can't sit down and argue. I can prove from history. I can prove grammatically. I can prove through prophecy being fulfilled right. in a dimension and a degree that uh, defies mathematic logic if it weren't God. I can prove all those things. But if you don't believe the Bible is inerrant, what you're essentially saying to me is you're an unbeliever. Wow. If you're an unbeliever... I can't help you until you begin really? to believe. The gospel doesn't work for unbelievers. It right. only works for those. Jesus said in the gospel, or, or John, pardon me, says in the prologue in, God, in John's gospel, the first chapter, he came into his own and his own received him not, but to as many as believed him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And yes. you've already said it. When, when Paul and Jesus and all of the New Testament writers write about the scriptures, they are not writing about Matthew for Revelation. Right. They are speaking of the Pentateuch. They are speaking of the Torah. They are speaking of the wisdom literature and the prophets, both yes. minor and major, and they're talking of... That's their Bible. Yes. Understand that. That's their Bible. And that's why Christianity, for me, is bulletproof. It's not Absolutely. just a... Even if it were, I would still believe it because even though it's 2,000 years old, I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. I don't believe Paul was confused. I don't believe Paul was uh, had some uh, financial gain in telling right. everyone Jesus. Paul was a Jew of Jews. Paul was the Jewish leader in his day. He was the right. premier Jewish guy that sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And he, yes, we could go through yes, the whole thing. Yes. Paul lost everything. The 12 men who were chickens and were cowards in yep. the Gospels lost, other than Judas, who went, by the way, of perdition. But the, these 11 lost their life. Yes. Gave their life for Jesus, with the exception of John, who, who, tried, who, who tried. God wouldn't let him die. He wouldn't let him die. He was bold and all these uh, yes. alienated and ostracized. Yes. These men turned into world changers. Yes. They had nothing to gain. Yes. We know the Gospel is real. The tomb is empty, et cetera. But when it comes to this... Um, when it comes to this issue of, of inerrancy, we have uh, people who have elevated some of the translations uh, and the conflict, conflicts of translation, yeah. and it is provided for a demon. I really believe this: a demonic assignment on the veracity and the legitimacy of the Word of God that has fed a deconstruction movement. In a generation that is wow. surrounded by humanism and pluralism, and and it's and so you have guys, gals who were raised in a church and they were preached the Bible, but never told why it's the Word of God, yes. and suddenly they begin to question the stories they were told about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den, Paul and 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 being shipwrecked, Jesus and the the virgin birth. Yes, I I 
Yeah. And so what do we do with that? Well, we continue to make a defense of our gospel. Mm -hmm. We continue to be uh, ready, prepared to give an answer for the questions that they ask as best we can. Yeah. But beyond that, we need more than a good talk Mm -hmm. because what I have found that calms and and soothes this these uh, these people who are caught up in deconstruct and and and, and I want to say this too, not all deconstructionism is evil. Right, absolutely. S- some of it was deconstruction of religion. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm, I welcome it. Absolutely, it's messy. We got some talking to do. Keep honor while you're having the conversation. Yeah. Don't throw babies out with bathwater when it comes to the con- issue of deconstructing religiosity. But I'm there for that. Yeah. The deconstruction I'm concerned about is the deconstruction of faith in Christ. And the reason we're deconstructing is now we question what we were taught as truth. And we see one thing or one person makes one pathetic, pitiful, unresearched argument. Right. And suddenly people who believe the truth now begin to believe a lie and have no underpinning or foundation on which they believe. And they begin to they begin to throw their faith in Christ and his word away. And I think that's a travesty. Absolute travesty. I think so. Okay, and we. And this is one thing that when it comes to deconstruction kind of blows my mind because when we use the word deconstruction, the yeah. word deconstruction is supposed to mean I am taking away what is wrong so I can rebuild the right thing. Sure. I am finding most people who say they are deconstructing, they are not deconstructing. It's just pure demolition. <laughs> it's demo day. That's good. That's really good. Because they're not, they have no plans to reconstruct anything. Anything. They, they don't come away with a stronger faith, a more fortified faith. Sure. Right? Which is what Jesus prayed over Simon. Say, Satan has asked to sift you like sift we, you I sweet. prayed that your Shake faith you. wouldn't fail. I prayed yeah. that your faith would be fortified. There is a fortified faith that we can have. But most people who claim to be quote unquote deconstructing, what they're really doing is listening to different preachers who are telling them what the scripture actually quote unquote means. They're not going into the Greek. They're no. not going into the no. original writings. They're not no. going from an academic thing. I am I am changing the well I am drinking from and choosing to believe this guy is right over the neighborhood preacher I grew up listening to yes. because he has some sort of ax to grind. He's been hurt by the church as well. And I am not trying to say that the church hasn't hurt people. Church has hurt people. Yeah. But it typically, I have, I have met very few people who mm. want to deconstruct and they're not coming from an emotional place. It, let's I'll, call it what it is. It's a place of offense. Yes, absolutely. It's always emotional. And, and, and it is emotional. And that's the, the concern I have is that much of the deconstructionism that I am at least intervening in the lives of these precious people that absolutely. I love, I'm not mad at them. No. Some of them have been scarred emotionally, even mentally, spiritually scarred from their encounters in churches, whether they were well-meaning or whether they, whether they intended to in, inflict some sort of harm. There are real tragedies with church hurt. Yeah, I get that. But if we're not careful and we don't know how to kindly, gently, lovingly speak the truth about this, what we do is we allow a spirit of offense to grow in the heart of a person like Esau who had a, had a root of bitterness yep. that wound up destroying his entire life. And I am concerned that people, um, again, we really have to have on the heart of compassion when it comes to dealing with people in reconstruct deconstruction. And as you said, more appropriately demolition, we really need to have a heart of compassion and we need to be able to hear beyond the foolishness that they're spewing. And we need to begin to hear where did this come from? Yes. Because you were raised in a, in, in, a, in a church who loved Jesus and they love you. But somewhere in your journey, either you didn't get picked on the ball team or you didn't get <laughs> you didn't get selected to teach yeah. Sunday school yeah. or something happened. And, and they're the most vitriolic people. I've never met people yeah. who are bitter like people who have church hurt bitterness. <laughs> I mean, so it's true. brutal. Some of them, I never was in any way connected to their church hurt. But they took all of their pain out on me. Yep. And I'm like, well, I don't even know your story. I don't even know where you came from. Give me a chance. They don't want that. And no. And there's a there's a. Uh, I'm going to tell you. And Jesus told us it was coming. Yeah. A spirit of offense. Yep. Would come. Sign of the times. A sign of the times. A spirit of offense. Think about how many people partner with a spirit of offense. Oh my God. To destroy, um, to destroy churches, destroy pastors, destroy. Uh, I've been thinking about this um, some lately. Um, 
You know, the Bible says don't entertain an, an accusation against an elder without one or two, without more than uh, one witness. You got to have two or more witnesses. Yeah. And there's a reason why he said that. Because I think Paul understood the volatility of ministry. And again, let's be very clear. If there are two or more witnesses, that person, be they in ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, whatever they are, if there are two or more witnesses and there's evidence of impropriety, evidence of pain inflicted, yeah. evidence of manipulation, evidence of abuse, that person should be held accountable to, Absolutely. The, to the highest extent. But, Absolutely. but, but let, let's, let's be clear, clear. The reason why Paul, I, one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons why Paul says, don't entertain an accusation against an elder without multiple witnesses. The reason I think Paul says that is because in ministry, you could tell the truth, and if one person doesn't like you, 100%. They, they could try to bring destruction on your ministry. And Paul was trying to tell us, be very careful about that. Yeah. And I, I just, it's a unique time. These are volatile times. And I think going back to where we very first started, authenticity is the key. Absolutely. Being a, you know, it's the highest compliment you paid me today is that you said um, you hugged Jaden and you gave him a kiss on the head. He's a son. He's been with me yep. five years. He's 19 years old and just got hired by a great church in Florida. When he came here, he was but a teenager. Yeah. And he's been, you know, he's rambunctious and honorary and he's, and he's got so much passion and zeal, but he became so, he's just an amazing kid. And I'm just so proud of him. And, and I'm proud of all of them. I pray, Absolutely. I pray any ceiling I have become the launching pad and the floor from which they leap from because I wow. want them, I want them to do great things for God. And, um, greater than I ever did. And the sad thing is I'm seeing that so few men in your position, so few people who God has given a platform to, mm. God has given um, influence to, maybe even like entrusted you with a name. Yeah. People know the name, Bishop Kevin Wallace. Yeah. I'm seeing so few people who actually have that heart to say, God, let my life be a launching pad for these the, the the next crop of men and women you're going to use in the earth. Yeah, It is, to me, again, and I'm, I'm not here to say who it is or who it isn't, but it seems like there are so many people who are still, just, they're trying to stay relevant. Yeah, I'm trying to keep my ministry flow. I'm trying to stay relevant that they don't ever platform other voices. So sad. And or they, in their minds, this platform's too big. For, and then they wait until they think they're absolutely polished. But if you wait until it, it you're just like, yeah, there's no way they're going to bomb. They can't be bomb proof unless they have places where they can get the reps. There are great, you're hundred percent right. And there are great preachers in our church, my church, the church. Yeah. I'm talking about 19, 20 year old females and males, yeah. young men, ladies and young men that are going to shake the earth and preach the gospel. And you know where they're going to start? Right here at our church. Amen. And we give them opportunity to preach. You don't get better preaching until you preach. It's true. You got to have constructive criticism. Yes. You got to tell people, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's make an adjustment here and, and do it in a way they don't get their, you know, their uh, confidence crushed. Yes. Cause, cause the, but I had to have that. I mean, the first sermon I ever pro preached, I preached about how Jesus had broken bones. My heart, <laughs> my heart was so pure. Oh Je Jesus, my gosh! Jesus suffered and died, and and I'm 15 years old, and and they and they beat him, and they and they smashed his bones. And my pastor come to me and said, <laughs> "Jesus never had a broken bone." And I said, "I'm so sorry." Oh my gosh! And I was 15 years old, and I took it like a champ, and I never preached on that. Again, well, that's of, good. Yeah, it, so you learn, yeah. but you got to have fathers that yes. pull, but pull sons and daughters together and say, yeah. uh, you know, make a little adjustment here, but not crush yeah. their authenticity or their creativity, or even the way that they, you know, they're passionate. You just got to help them make sure they got that interpretive lens right. But the bottom line right. here is this: give them an opportunity. I, I believe with all of my heart that I'm trying to position myself that I don't have to pastor this church when I'm old and ancient and they have to prop me up or wheel me in. Yeah. I want to be able to travel the world and plant churches with sons and daughters one day. Amen. I want to give this ministry in time and I'm not ready for that now. It's not that season now right. by the grace of God, but I want to, I want to leave this in a healthy place and move before I am irrelevant. 
And what keeps you relevant is not that you keep holding on to a position. What keeps you relevant is that you keep producing sons and daughters. Absolutely. And it's called self-preservation. We want to preserve self. Mm -hmm. And it kills sons and daughters when we do it. Absolutely. So I've made up my mind. I'll be faithful with the influence God gave me and the revelation God's given me to preach the truth. But I just have found such joy Mm -hmm. in pulling guys like Jaden aside. Yeah. Guys like Judah, guys like uh, young ladies like Tere, who's, you, you will know that name, that young lady. She's in our school of ministry, a powerhouse. She was on the band panel today. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. she started talking about Mr. Potato Head. Yeah, so good. That young lady's a preacher. Oh, for sure. And you just have to give them an opportunity to fly. Absolutely. And that's what I'm going to do with my life. Absolutely. I think in this season of my life, I'm 29. At this season of my life, when I was 18, it was the guys who were 29 to 35 that I was like, man, they're, they're the One guys. Day. They're the guys. And I'm not acting like I don't still honor them. I do. And I, if, I, if I don't feel like there's still something there I can honor now, I honor the way God used them in my story. That's a brilliant Absolutely. way to put it. Yeah. I, I'm like so thankful for the way God used them. Um, but for me in this season, the men I'm looking to, are those men who have embraced mm. that father mm-hmm. season. Yeah. I, I'm, it, to be specific, I mean, men like yourself, mm. Bishop Kevin Wallace, uh, Jensen Franklin, Pastor Jensen. Yeah, he's a, absolute, a general. Uh, oh, absolute general in the faith. Beth and I love him. Um, honestly, I listen to a lot of Rod Parsley. Yeah. I really enjoy Pastor Rod. I'm looking for people who are not compromising on uh, the anointing, yeah. not compromising on orthodoxy sure. and not compromising on, in my, in my opinion, like preaching hard truth, yeah, preaching things that like, Hey, this is not going to just be the nice little palatable thing that people just wanted to come. And, no. and I have nothing wrong with that. I think there are certain, I could name names, but there are certain people um, who hate certain preachers because they're just too encouraging. I think some people that's their, that's their lane. Like yeah, that's their call. Is. And I honor them in that. Um, do yeah. I think that just listening to them is a balanced diet of everything God has to say? No, but I don't. I don't think they're wrong. I don't think they're heretics. But they might be balancing the the rest of the body that is focused on the negative, exactly, and the heavy and yeah. the dark. And we need those we voices need that warn. Yes, but watch we me all, on the wall. Yes, sir. But we also need smiling people that remind us the righteousness key peace and joy Amen. in the Holy Ghost is Amen. the portion of God's people. Amen. Yeah, and and I honor. <laughs> All of them. Yes, sir. And I love on all of them. Yes, sir. And I think that's the thing we've got to remember is God places members in the body as yeah. it pleases him. Beautiful. And who are we to come up against the man of God? And I'm the not body? doing it. I'm, I ain't doing it. I'm not wasting my time or investing my energy in attacking other people. A, it's dangerous, and B, is unprofitable. No. I know more people who have um, exposed 50 different pastors, but never showed one person who Jesus is. Which is a tremendous issue. Yeah. It's a problem. You expose all these pastors, but you can't ever show anyone who Jesus is. Major issue. Uh, wow. Bishop, thank you so much for coming on today. This was absolutely I incredible. Hope, I hope it's what uh, the, the the people of God watching, I hope it's what they were expecting. I hope it's what you were expecting. Oh, this, 100%, has a, this is this infinitely has been a fun, better. A fun conversation this has and, been a, and infinitely powerful. Better. Thank you so much. Again, thank you. Hey, if you would like to connect with Bishop, all of the stuff is in the description below. His Instagram. You can check out what they're doing here in Chattanooga. Uh, get plugged in with the Ruwak Network. Oh, yeah. Um, awesome. But yeah, it, this is a safe place, man. Get involved. If you're a pastor, you should get, for real, get involved with Ruwak. But we love you. See you on the next episode.